the competition. All right, so I think we're ready to get started with our first session. Uh, the first session of the day is uh, New Ideas of Feminism, and the speakers are uh, social activist Gurmehar Kaur, uh, independent filmmaker, media trainer, and fashion entrepreneur uh, Natasha Badhwar, uh, award-winning print and broadcast journalist uh, who wrote the best-selling I Am a Troll inside the BJP's secret digital army, uh, Swati Chaturvedi, and uh, finally, independent journalist and author Amu Joseph. Um, American author Heidi, Heidi Julevitz, who was supposed to have been a part of this session, has unfortunately been uh, hospitalized due to, due to a medical emergency and couldn't travel to India. So our session will, uh, will commence shortly with our four speakers. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for turning out uh, on a Monday morning for this uh, uh, session. Um, and thanks to the Hindu Lit Fest uh, uh, organizers for putting this panel together. To me, the topic of this panel is rather intriguing because, as I see it, one of the most interesting and exciting characteristics of feminism is, that, is the stream of new ideas that have enhanced and enriched it over the decades. Essentially, of course, feminism is the belief in the social, political, economic, and sexual equality of the sexes. But there have always been different shades of opinion within that basic understanding, represented by radical feminism, socialist feminism, Marxist feminism, liberal feminism, and later eco-feminism and cultural feminism, postmodern feminism, etc. So concepts of uh, uh, feminism have uh, evolved over the years. And, um, and obviously, there are some new ideas that have come up re more recently, which we'll be talking about during this panel. Concepts of feminism have also been influenced by location. Third world or southern feminisms, uh, South Asian feminisms, African sem uh, feminisms, etc. Also by religious identity. There's Christian feminism, Muslim feminism, and so on. And by other identities. Dalit feminism, queer feminism, and so on. Feminism has also enabled men to question the limiting ideas of masculinity and rigid gender roles imposed by patriarchy on men and boys. It has also helped us go beyond the binaries of male and female and explore a wider range of gender and sexual identities. In fact, it would have been great if all the genders had been represented on this panel, I think. I think it's also worth remembering that feminism has contributed to our understanding of many academic fields, such as economics, history, sociology, um, aesthetics, and, and also that it has contributed to almost all cultural fields, including in the context of this festival, uh, literature and literary criticism. Um, yesterday, I asked a few friends to send me uh, their favorite quotes about feminism. And uh, the one which was sent by my friend Swarna Rajgopal, who's here, is also one of my favorites. So I thought I would share it uh, uh, as a kind of opening um, uh, remarks. Feminism has fought no wars. It has killed no opponents. It has set up no concentration camps, starved no enemies, practiced no cruelties. Its battles have been for education, for the vote, for better working conditions, for safety in the streets, for childcare, for social welfare, for rape crisis centers, women's refuges, reforms in the law. If someone says, oh, I'm not a feminist, I ask, why? What's your problem? This is a quote from Dale Spender. Um, so I think we'll start now with the panelists. And I think, I don't know how many of you have done your homework and read up about the um, uh, panelists. But in case you haven't, I'll just quickly introduce them. Gurmehar Kaur is a social activist and ambassador of Sp Postcards for Peace, a non-profit charitable organization. 
She is pursuing English literature at Sh Lady Shiram College for Women in Delhi, while also working on her book, Small Acts of Freedom, which will be released sometime later this month. <laughs> Time magazine has hailed her as a free speech warrior in their annual Next Generation Leaders list. She uh, mentioned a little while ago that she's also written an entire essay on feminism. So I'm sure she, she will enlighten us on uh, feminism from her perspective. Um, then, of course, there's Natasha Badwar, uh, <coughs> who um, it says here was born in Ranchi, grew up in Ka Kolkata, and refused to accept Delhi as home for the next three decades, which particularly endears you to me. He's the author of uh, My Daughter's Mum, a collection of searing, candid essays where she interweaves the personal and the political in a resonant style. Um, her second book, which is a sequel, sequel um, of this, will be out uh, later this year. Natasha began her career in broadcast journalism with uh, NDTV as the first female videographer in news television in India. She quit 13 years later as Vice President Training and Development and now works as an independent filmmaker, media trainer and fashion entrepreneur, which I didn't know about. Um, she's a columnist with Mint Lounge, in fact, a much-loved columnist, I might say. She lives in New Delhi with her husband and three daughters. She's also working on another book uh, with Harsh Mandar on the Karwan e Mohabbat, pardon my pronunciation, uh, uh, the uh, project that she and Harsh Mandar have been working on. Then we come to Swati Chaturvedi who is an award-winning print and broadcast journalist who has worked for The Statesman, The Indian Express, Hindustan Times, and Z News. Her first book, Daddy's Girl, A Murder Mystery, was published by Penguin Random House in September 2016. Her second, a non-fiction investigation, was published in December 2016 to international acclaim. It was titled, I am a troll inside the BJP's secret digital army has received wide coverage for its investigation into how the party in power is paying to abuse citizens in a democracy. Swati has been regularly contributing uh, investigative stories and analyses to NDTV.com, Dailyo, uh, The Wire, The Hindu Business Line, and so on. And apparently she's also working on a new book but it's a secret project and which she cannot talk about right now. Um, so um, I think we will start by each of the panelists uh, uh, talking a little about um, uh, their ideas of feminism, new ideas, old ideas, and whether their ideas have changed, if, if so, in what way, etc. cetera. So um, Natasha, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so, um, I've also written about this. Uh, feminism is a word that um, I stumbled upon in my um, mid-teens. And suddenly, I had a word that explained half my life, almost all my life. I, um, I was, I'm born in a Punjabi family. Um, a partition um, was a, is a big story. Um, for my grandparents and my parents who were, who were both refugees. And um, I found myself nestled between two brothers, my older brother and my younger brother. And um, you know, I'm a much beloved daughter, uh, apple of my father's eye. And yet, uh, throughout my growing up years, from a very, very early age, uh, when we heard partition stories, we also heard the stories of Punjabi valor. Uh, we would rather see our daughters dead than dishonored. And uh, how does that sound to a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old daughter who is so loved by her father that he might want to see her dead? Uh, um, the, you know, uh, between my brothers and me, this one's going to be a doctor, this one's going to be an engineer. And you should be a teacher because teaching job is 
uh, you know, good, good for women, then you can raise your children and uh, also be with your in-laws uh, while you're pursuing your career. So the greatest ambitions that the greatest love uh, expressed were still limited by notions of gender and gender roles by the idea that this is a woman's place in the world and it makes no sense to a child all children uh, are born with a sense that they are unique uh, that they are wonderful and they have a right to create that wonderful life for themselves and uh, you know we uh, literally uh, parenting and uh, social conditioning and school education hammers it out of them bit by bit and um, I, I resisted that as a child I you know there was a huge dissonance uh, and I it didn't make any sense to me because clearly my brothers and I were equal and yet everything was a little different uh, for ourselves, uh, for, for us, it was supposed to be different. We were constantly reminded that we were different. And uh, so when I stumbled upon the word feminism, uh, and uh, when I, uh, you know, uh, read books, uh, began to read books, and I read Alice Walker, and I read a lot of black American poetry that I found in our school library, and I read uh, columns by women in the Hindu, <laughs> and the Times of India and you know I would gravitate towards the woman's voice because she would be telling a story that I wanted to hear that I was hungry to hear that I had not heard enough of and uh, so you know when this word came I said oh that explains it there is an idea out there that tells me that what I am feeling is right and, and you know that kind of got me through uh, many uh, the, you know the next decade so you said oh I'm a feminist and that explains and, and feminism is the right way to be and then come the uh, you know the conflicts um, uh, you fall in love your friends fall in love you enter workplaces uh, there are gender dynamics within your most intimate relationships uh, in your workplaces within your family as um, your cousins begin to get married and the arranged marriage drama starts in every Indian family and and you start making judgments and you you know you're now an adult so uh, you can express uh, yourself and you've also got these ideas that you have borrowed and absorbed from others and so the 20s and you know I, I watch Gurmeher and I say it's so easy for you because <laughs> you know you're in that stage in the 20s you're so sure of everything because you've made up your mind this is right and this is wrong and by your late 20s, you realize how much patriarchy you have internalized yourself, how much you are judging other women um, because you have decided that this is the right way to be and this is the wrong way to be and that's not feminist. You're excluding people and you, so you, you discover that there are layers and layers and layers that you need to chip away at every day of your life, that your comfort zone is a very temporary respite you need to get out of that again and again and and you know and that new comfort zone that you had found with fellow feminists is also something that gets threatened because there are differences amongst yourselves about what is how, how far you're willing to push things how far you're willing to question things and then you re and then, then then comes this next stage uh, in our um, you know uh, adulthood when you find out that part of your feminist learning is about learning about differences amongst yourselves uh, learning about being inclusive uh, you realize it's not just a fight it's also a celebration uh, you don't just stand up for people when they are down you stand up for them every day you create opportunities uh, like opportunities have been created for you you write about other people like others have allowed you to write about yourself and uh, and it, it just continues to get really fascinating so just when you think you've got it figured out comes something new uh, uh, for example right now the me too movement uh, you know which has pushed the envelope it, it suddenly uh, and so massively for so many 
of us uh, who have engaged with it and, and whose lives it is going to touch. And, uh, and that's the fantastic thing about this, this kind of candle that I found that first shone a light on things is that it just, it's a light that continues to grow. And it is something that um, you take with yourself uh, you allow it to break you, you allow it to break your own, uh, you know, internalized stereotypes of what is right, what is wrong, who you accept, who you don't. And uh, you constantly open yourself to rethinking things that you had accepted. And, uh, and, and I'm really glad uh, that, you know, that, that there is, that, that this word continues to uh, guide me and uh, help me find uh, you know, illuminate, uh, continues to illuminate my life in a sense. Thank you. Hi guys, uh, thank you for turning up on a Monday morning for the first session. I was very sleepy too, so thank you. Uh, talking about feminism, I think every time somebody asks somebody asked me this question are you a feminist and the first thought that comes to my mind it is that yes I am and this is something that I've spoken about a lot so I grew up with just women in my family uh, in my house there was no male member I went to a all girls convent school till grade 5 and I was so basically so all the years that I was growing up I was only surrounded by women there were barely any men and in that little bubble of a world which only has women there were no gender roles. My mother was the one who was working. My mother was the one who was driving a car. My nani was the one who was taking care of all the household things. And my nani is, was also somebody who was earning her own living through the little things that she did back, back when we were children. The first time I, so it was, a, it was a play date. I went to a friend's house. I was in uh, first standard. And my mom dropped me to her place and then told me, listen, uh, it's a Saturday. I have a meeting. So just ask her mom or ask somebody in her house to get uh, to drop you back at home. And we're done playing with Barbie dolls, we're done playing kitchen kitchen and we're done playing and we're done painting and doing whatever little homework we had to do. I look up to her, I'm like, listen, it's five o'clock. My mom is going to be very mad if I, if, I, if I go home post sunset. Can you ask your mom to drop me? And there's a car in the driveway and there's a mummy at home and the mummy is extremely amazing. She's been feeding us, she's been teaching us and she taught us how to make little flowers and I think this she's a perfect mother and my friend tells me yeah but my dad's not home yet and I look at her I'm like yeah but your dad doesn't have to be home for your mother to drop me you can just put a tala on the gate and walk and she's like no it's not that my mother doesn't know how to drive and this is when I was uh, this is long time back when I was I think maybe in 2002 so this woman, uh, so this little girl's mom doesn't know how to drive and it just hit me like a storm that okay, there are women who may not know how to drive. <laughs> and, it, and it was so strange. That was the first time I realized that there, there is a gender partiality, that there are certain things that men are supposed to do and women are not. So, ever, so since that day, I started looking around on traffic signals and thinking how many women are driving a car? And I, and I kid you not, in, in the small town that I lived in, I grew up in, my mother, at, a, at so many signal stops, was probably the only woman driving. Over years, it improved. Over years, you know, women started driving and women started taking up these roles. But initially, back in very early 2000s, I saw my mother defy all gender roles. So that way, in that sense, I, I think I just grew up a feminist. The first time I realized how, uh, the first time I realized how I was. Uh, I was a different gender was when I went to my boarding school in grade six. Uh, it was a co-educational boarding school and I was very excited. I think, uh, and it was a tennis academy. I was very excited. I was like, this is it. Now I have moved out of my house. This is true freedom. My mommy is not going to, my mom's not going to check my homework. She's not going to, uh, she's not going to bully me into sitting down and studying. Uh, it's a boarding school. Every night is going to be a sleepover with a bunch of girls in the dorm room. I get to do my hair and I was very excited. I was like, this is true freedom. Uh, on the first day of our orientation, uh, the, the hostel that I was in, uh, we had a, a cricket match screening where the boys and the girls were asked to sit. So I ran down from my, I ran down, my, host my domes were on the third, fourth floor and the screening was on the ground floor in the amphitheater. So I ran down and this teacher stops me and she's like, where, where are you running and why are you wearing a pair of shorts? 
I was, and in my head I'm thinking, yeah, that's because I just finished a tennis session. I play tennis in very tiny shorts or whatever because that's how tennis is supposed to be played. And now I'm just going to watch the match. She's like, no, 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 but you have to cover your knees and your shoulders and then go. There are going to be boys there. And I was like, yeah, but there are boys on the tennis court as well who I'm competing and beating and winning and probably <laughs> acing my way uh, to winning matches. And they're like, no, but you have to wear a skirt. It, and it was such a shock that these are boys that I'm playing with, that I'm on a, on a sport I'm better skilled at. And yet I need to, after a certain point, I need to cover my legs because I'm a woman. And I walk down and I, uh, I walk down and I, oh no, I go up, I change into pajamas, I go down again and we sit. So there's a segregation. Just say Mandir Gurdwaro mein hoti hai. The boys are sitting here and the girls are sitting there. And this is sixth standard. But and we've s and, we're, and okay, I just make my way and I'm like, fine, I'll just go sit with the girls. It's fine, it doesn't really matter. And there's the tennis, uh, there's a cricket match that's going on. We're watching it. At 8.30, the warden comes and they're like, okay, all the girls, let's go back to your domes. And I look at her, I'm like, but abhi to do over baki hai, aise kaise chale jayenge? Hame pata nahi chale ga result. It's a, it's a World Cup uh, semi-final against Sri Lanka. And they're like, no, 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 but you have to go up because uh, it's 8.30 and we have to lock your domes from outside. And I'm, and it just, and that was the first time it hit me how different, and the boys were allowed to sit for the match. One, because it's generally assumed that the boys enjoy cricket so much that you cannot take away this right to watching sports. And this is a sports academy. And the second thing that women need to be at 8.30, you know, and yeah, and at 8.30, as the sun sets, you need to take all the, all the girls and just lock them in dome rooms. And all of this is the first day of my boarding, the orientation day. Uh, and what's really strange is that I was in sixth standard, that you're sexualizing women who are, who've just hit puberty, that you think that, that 12 year old girls will entice boys into, but that's the mentality, right? And that's exactly what's problematic. When you, when you, and, and what's the, and the worst part is this educational institute is teaching boys that, you know what? The girls, we will, the society will control the girls. You don't have to control anything. No one is teaching the boys not to misbehave. It's like standard boys. But everyone's teaching the girls, do not wear shorts in the same, in the same day. And that's a series, do not wear shorts, sit in a corner, go to the room at 8.30, while the boys are wearing the same shorts. Are, and it's just strange. So I think the idea for me is always, well, if. I don't mind going up at 8.30, but you teach your boys the same. Lock the predators up, don't lock us up. So I, of course, completely agree with her, and I second everything she said. And you know, we are, I'm going to make this a little bit political. We are in a country where we talk about, officially talk about beti bachao, beti parhao. And you know, you have social media where women journalists like me, liberals are attacked. And they're attacked, women are attacked sexually, men are attacked with corruption. So I think, you know, right then and there, it is in a nutshell what is going on in our country. You know, why do you need a beti bachao, beti padhao? Why not a bete ko samjhao? You know, what is going on? I mean, I think feminism is everyday acts of bravery. You know, every single day in India, I mean, we have no Me Too movement, we have no Time's Up. Because time is not up. I mean, I'm so happy to see men here. Because I'm sure all of you identify as feminists. There is no other way to be. I mean, why do we even today have to even talk about being feminists? Is there any other way to be? But we are in a country which is so deeply patriarchal that you know you you give women at the top of the political heap. You know, you give them uh, Ministry of Child and Women Welfare. You run schemes, but yet. You know, you still want women to be sanskari, you want to block them up, lock them up. This 8 o'clock thing is amazing. We have a Chief Justice of India today, right now, who said that the BHU girls should be locked up because that's what he does with his own daughter. He escorts his own daughter. So, you know, I mean, when people in authority of, say, a Supreme Court judge can even say this publicly, I mean, we, we don't want to have any Me Too movement or Time's Up. I don't think Time is up. And I, you know, I'm, I'm actually sad the time is not up because all my life I've done exactly what I wanted in terms of my work. And uh, I mean, I feel really sad at girls like this, my Gurmeher for instance. I mean, the, the very fact that she had to tell the story in the shorts thing. I mean, who is going to tell you what to wear? I mean, does anyone tell a man what to wear? 
you have out of shape men walking around very exactly what they want they should be uh, they should be upsetting us on aesthetic grounds they're not so you know we i you know we are not at a level or or any inflection point where things like me too or times up even resonates with us and i'd love to talk to you guys about why you know why are we not there that's all i want to say yeah, i think um, you know what another favorite quote of mine is uh, i'm a feminist because i'm not an idiot and uh, of course fa feminism is the radical idea that women are human um yesterday taslima nasreen uh, said i don't understand why people who believe in gender equality and women's rights hate the term feminism and prefer to say oh i'm not a feminist i'm a humanist according to she said you can't be a humanist if you're not a feminist so I, I thought just before i mean we should uh, definitely have uh, uh, a lot of audience interaction but before that i just want to switch to a kind of looking at the whole thing from a lit lens since this is a literary festival and so i thought i would uh, uh, bring up this uh, 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 shashi desh pandey's uh, uh, quote very often uh, she makes a distinction between being a feminist and being a feminist writer she uh, wrote a wonderful essay many many years ago called why i am a feminist which is included in her book writing from the margins and other essays but she refuses to be described as a feminist writer of course journalists often miss the uh, subtleties of her position and there have been misleading headlines suggesting that she says i am not a feminist but she's actually uh, gone on record uh, in a very very beautiful essay uh, on why i am a feminist but she does make this distinction about not being a feminist writer so i would like to have your responses to that so we are all agreed that it's okay to be a feminist <laughs> um i'm wondering uh, what box you find yourself pushed into when the label feminist is added to uh you know your writing uh I in a sense it's uh, similar to constantly being called a woman writer you know i'm not a woman writer i'm a writer uh yesterday i met one of my colleagues from ndtv uh and uh, you know and 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 i was with gurmeher and we were talking about the time when i was a, a camera person with ndtv so uh, you know like uh, gurmeher was describing herself uh, you know you're playing tennis you're doing what you want to do when you're a certain age and uh, it's when the barriers start coming that you begin to realize that uh, you know that there is a pushback that you're being asked to diminish yourself to fit into a certain kind of uh, box that is uh, pre um, uh, prefabricated for you and you and you're going to break that box Uh, so uh, you know one of the things that came up in our conversation yesterday was i i just stood like this and i said i'm a cameraman and uh, you know and, and she said is that what you call yourself i said you know there was so much struggle uh, that other people went through to find a word to describe me and they would say um uh, madam camera lady uh, camera girl uh, camera you know so i'm doing my job right and i'm doing the same job that you're doing so i would say just call me a cameraman because at least that way you can fit in your head that what i am doing is exactly what he's doing and when there is a job i'm going to pick it up and do it as well as i can as well as my talent and my effort allows me to do it so just like i'm not a feminist camera person it becomes easier i suppose <laughs> uh, you know when you put it uh to um other uh, you know you're not a feminist doctor you take care of your patients as and when they are required to so as a writer you write with empathy you uh, you know you ri you write with scrutiny uh, you create characters you give them lives whether you're writing fiction or non fiction you represent uh, truths uh and you and you tell stories and you don't you know 
just because you happen to be a woman who is willing to stand up for herself and for every other woman does not mean that you are now going to be put into a special category and your work is going to be judged in that way. So I, I, I understand that you, know, you don't want your work to get these labels which is again going to diminish it and put it in a category which may not be of interest to a larger readership. So, so you do you push back against labels like that, and once in a while you also just throw the whole thing, you know, to the side and say, "I'm done with your labels. You can call me a cameraman, if that's how you understand what a person does with this camera. I I'll embrace this label." as a feminist, um, so I've thought about it and I've really, I don't know, is my book a feminist book? I, I remember I started writing this book when I was uh, 12 years old. Uh, it, the idea mostly came from, so I read a lot, of, uh, I read a lot growing up, mostly because I was, a, quite, I was quite a loner in school and nobody wanted to be my friend, so I had to be with the book alone in the library because, yeah, but that's a very sad part. Anyway, moving on, I will not dwell into that, but yeah. So I read a lot and I realized, uh, and I was thinking I was watching TV while I was, uh, while I was exposed to a lot of books as well, and I realized that the books, uh, the TV does not represent my life. I can't relate to anything that's happening there because the TV you see a perfect family with a mummy, a papa and four little boys and a little girl who is dressed in pink frocks and that's not my home so I don't relate to it. I moved towards, I gravitated more towards reading books like Little Women where it's a mom and the father's gone away for war and there are four young girls and I was like you know what this is something that I want to read and this is something that I relate to. And as, and while I was growing up, I, I also I tried to find more war literature because usually war lit there's something about war literature. It's always very, it's uh, somehow they they are women's stories because the men are always gone for war, the, especially the post World War literature. And I and I thought, well, you know what? India has seen a war, and let's see if there are books uh, post Cargill, and there weren't any except for a few journalistic accounts and of, except for a few technical books that were published later, there was no book that was telling a story. So at 12 years of age, I, we, we had recently bought a new computer at home. I just sat down, I was playing around and after, and w the, the driving rash game was too boring after a certain point and I was like, okay, let's uh, figure out uh, WordPress, uh, wo uh, word, word, the Word document. And I, I typed in the memories of my father that I had and I showed it to my mom. I was like, mom, look, I've written this little, and I, and I wrote by then. I started writing and I was uh, submitting a lot of essays uh, by the time I was 12. My mother saw it and she's like, you know what, you can write a whole book of the memories that you have of your father and that way you won't lose those memories. Over time, as I grew up, as I grew, I grew from a 12 year old to a 21 year old, I realized that the story of my father or the memories of my father cannot be told without my mother. I cannot talk about my dad without speaking, without talking about my mother because it's through her that these memories are alive. I, and I think it's, and hers, and while I'm, and we're talking bravery and I want to talk about bravery. Growing up, I understood this uh, since I was born in a family with, uh, with generations of army officers, with uh, generations of men in uniform. I. As a child, there was a certain concept of bravery, that bravery is supposed to be very, it's physical, it has to be very machoistic, it has to be, uh, you have to be a strong kid, which is also why, maybe, which, is, which is maybe why I picked up a sport over painting when I had the chance, which is why I picked up tennis and uh, I thought I want to be an athlete. Uh, then I want to be a dancer because I wanted to be brave like my father. And I grew up and I realized, and at 16, 20, I realized, well, bravery is just not physical. There's so much emotional bravery that you need to live the life you want to live, to be a single woman and raise two daughters, to grow up in a household, to go to work and make, ch and make the choices that she has made for me. And I feel like, and I think which is my book a feminist book? I'm just telling a true story. I'm just telling a story of uh, three women from a small town in Jalandhar who raised a crazy girl who does not know how to shut up. Is this a feminist story? I don't know. Is it? Yeah, well, it's about yeah, it's about yeah, three women who raised a crazy daughter who does not know how to shut up, even in the face of 
the highest authorities is it feminism i don't know if it is then i'm i'm very happy then i'm going to embrace the label but it's also a true story and just and it's so important to look around all of us and see that there is a feminist story and which is why it's called small acts of freedom because it is those small acts it is driving that car it is uh, saying well you know what i have two daughters but i'm going to send them off to a tennis boarding school and have them home school even when all the men in the family are saying no but padhai is the way to go it is making that choice or it's saying you know what i'm sending my daughter back to delhi i don't care how many debt she is getting because she needs to be educated when all the men in the family are saying no but just keep her home delhi is not safe at all now it's not safe anyway so the small act so i think all of us eh, we're all a story to be told swati uh, i was just wondering whether you uh, you could say whatever you like of course but uh, but i was also wondering since your book is about trolling whether you'd like to talk about the particular ways in which uh, women are attacked by trolls yes i mean i wrote the book because i was horribly trolled i mean i was attacked uh, i mean i filed an fir and uh, very rarely that the twitter corporate they cooperated they gave the delhi police the ip address and nobody was arrested no nothing was no action was taken so since i'm a journalist i mean not a woman journalist but a journalist i decided to do what i do which is investigate my work is investigative journalism so i said that you know that i'm going to find out that why i mean in fact gurmeher i think is the best thing that the bjp id cell has done she has come to our attention only because they went mad trolling her death threats rape threats you know anything you name it both of us have faced it so my book was only because they went fairly attacking me and they they came up you know as a journalist you deal with facts and truth and you know you are accountable for every word you write in my case it was just slander and i was like you know i am not going to be defined by something which somebody has randomly made up about me and what do i do i'm a journalist i mean i'm woman feminist whatever i don't care so which is what i did which is just the investigation i did i turned to troll and i found out that it was all organized and none of us needed to go through that and this is it's bigger it's in a democracy why should the government or the party in power attack its own citizens i mean we are not democracy then and i think gurmeher is the she was a kid you know why would you feel the need as the party in power you the government for god's sake to go after one little kid who decided that she was anti war because she lost her father so to me that is unacceptable in a democracy and that's the reason i wrote the book but something about the particular ways in which trolls attack women um yes everybody is having an affair with some politician they've caught you in the act they i mean i i'm sorry you are a family audience a family newspaper i cannot i mean there is no chance of me kind of even going into the ways uh, the creative rape threats i get the kind of things they want to do to me the kind of things i have done you know it is it is a world of forget alternative facts it's an alternative universe <laughs> and because i have three daughters it goes one step further and i am told what they will do to those little children and in what kind of dump what kind of ways their mutilated bodies will be found by me so that's the way in which trolls attack women and their daughters and their mothers yeah. and them and them yeah but then i think uh, uh, since we've talked we've talked about trolls and you've written a book on how it's uh, be, uh, it's a troll army out there by a certain political uh, party but i also want to talk about how it's uh, especially with me it wasn't just it there wasn't uh, it wasn't just trolls i think there were men apparent who apparently meant good and were saying but you're a young girl so you should just keep quiet you don't know anything and i had a, i had this mp some harvard graduate write me an open letter saying well you know what you can do whatever you can join politics and and it's a long letter it's an open letter which was i think which was everywhere and i read it and i skimmed through it and i and the first thing i did was i rolled my eyes i was like you're you're a nobody you don't know uh, the first thing about me you've only read about me in a in a little Uh, in in the news and you're coming and writing giving me this life advice from a paternal figure this may and this this and he wants me to and the le- the tone of the letter was that i am the greatest human being ever you're a little child i understand what you're going through but this is and i'm giving you life advice 
so now you can join politics if you want in the future you can say whatever you want in the future but let me tell you the whole co the now let me explain to you the whole issue of india and pakistan and then he in details he writes about and i look at this letter and i'm skimming through it and i'm it just just the fact and what really got me angry was the fact that this, that this man thinks what my life has been my reality that he knows my reality my life my struggles better than me that he knows some an issue or a conflict that i face on a daily basis every time i wake up every time i realize that i have an empty seat on the dining table every time i realize that i only have one phone phone call or one figure to call and look up to every time i i'm you know i'm exposed to the emptiness that there is and that's when i and this person just walks in and says well i am a powerful man and i know better and i think in that sense it's even you're being trolled sexually but you're all but then older men or just men in general will come and patronize you and say well you know what you're right and everything but i know better honestly women if you if you think you i think women just know what they're talking about and men should just not speak <laughs> i'm a feminazi yes <laughs> Okay, now we have about ten minutes, uh, and so we'll open up the uh, floor to questions and comments from the audience. Uh, Good mayor, uh, uh, I really like the comment when you said, you know, uh, war killed my father, because I believe that you know, uh, war doesn't decide who's right; it decides who's left. Yeah. Uh, but in this in this talk, you call men predators, your classmates. I don't know them personally. Uh, Okay. On a personal note, my ex-wife cheated on me. I'm not with her anymore. I don't go around calling women names. I'm with my girlfriend. I cherish her company. So why call men predators? You know? Oh, I'm not calling men predators. I was very in context of what I just said. So also, I think I think I agree with you when you say that your ex-wife. I mean, I'm not saying I agree. I think uh, like this is something that I really want to. Uh, I maybe should have brought up earlier. Uh, people keep talking about how feminism is about equality. I, as much as it is as it is about equality, it is about uh, standing up to patriarchy. It is about ending patriarchal system. And in that, and I understand where you're coming from. And patriarchy is also a system where they say that men are supposed to do a certain things, pay on dates, open car doors, you know, and men are not supposed to cry. And I understand that. I mean. Uh, are men predators? I mean, I definitely don't think I said it in that sense. It was in context. I hope you're not offended. <laughs> uh, uh, excuse me, madam. Uh, I'm a media lecturer uh, in Chennai. And uh, I find the portrayal of women in media uh, needs improvement and better one. Uh, so women have to be portrayed as mothers, daughters, and all that. Uh, so women are exploited for their looks and all that. So what do you think, uh, uh, can you uh, suggest some remedy so that we can uh, correct the women's portrayal? Thank you. Women's writing, women filmmakers, read women, women's books, publish women's books. Uh, you know, if you look at the statistics of how many films are made by women, how many serials are written and made by women, how many uh, women artists are, have any control over the roles that they are asked to play, that needs to change. A lot of actresses, like we said, uh, like Swati said, we are nowhere close to the Me Too movement, but you never know, you might get there tomorrow. So there are so many actresses, particularly in the South, who are standing up and saying, we are not going to accept this kind of demeaning uh, atmosphere at our workplaces. They are being attacked. It is the responsibility of each one of us to speak up for them, to give them strength, to say we stand with women who are going to stand up for themselves and we are going to help others to do that. And in the real world have no gender pay disparity. I think that's a big thing, you know. Why are men paid more than women? It's just they do the same work. I think India is uh, one of the very few, if not the only country where you have boys only school, girls only school, boys only college. You are part of a girls only college. Yeah. Now don't you think that is right against feministic ideals where if, if a society is made of men and women, then why have institutions that is only uh, men or women where then men really don't get the opportunity to understand what a woman is, what 
why they are how they are Family, right from families are not age. all male or all female families is the ground on which we learn everything about the world the segregation starts in the family so you have to look at the structure of family society education systems workplaces public spaces there is segregation so sometimes it's actually a respite uh, to be in an all women's institution you're safe you can be yourself you can wear what you want yeah and it's not india specific so i i i think y uh, you know just going after institutions uh, educational institutions that are men only or girls only is not going to solve anything we have to look at the structure of patriarchy as it exists everywhere the f the home in which the girl or the boy is born for starters is not segregated right and yet the segregation is there the mother is confined to a certain role so is the father both of them have injustice meted out to them when m boys are not allowed to choose the arts when they are not allowed to become who they are uh, the arts or the sports or you know robotics whatever it is that they want when they are not allowed to do that we are doing as much injustice to them you know so uh, you know when 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 she said uh, lock up the predators she didn't mean lock up those 10 uh, year old boys don't look at those 10 year old boys as if they are wanna be predators yeah hello ma'am so uh, i've often noticed that if a woman wants to bring about an idea or if suppose she wants to take up a leading role it you need to be perfect like there is no room for fault and you have to convince people that this is the perfect idea i want to know if you have experienced this while writing your books or while putting forward your ideas and what are your thoughts about it is this the sad truth in the society today hi um this is about um, i mean as you all said um, uh, we have as women we have faced gender bias and been trolled and st stuff like that so uh, how do we change this concept of feminism like as amu joseph rightly said uh, if i say i'm a feminist i am looked at as a female rebel so to change the concept of uh, feminism it has to start young so do you think uh, as the new idea of feminism to inculcate this probably in the curriculum of a school or maybe have a complete set of literature which uh, throws light on what exactly is feminism because feminism is misunderstood even amongst educated classes i mean amongst our people also so the second one or maybe to everybody good morning um, uh, um, the concept of me too how rational it is can you objectively answer it otherwise you are doing injustice to your brother your father your son and your son in law you know uh, feminism is misunderstood and feminism needs to explain itself feminism is willfully misunderstood it's willful uh so uh this onus uh you know i i have a personal story here <laughs> i'm going to tell you very uh, in in short when i first began to see the man i fell in love with and who is now the father of my three children my husband when i first began to see him he came to me one day and he said my friends tell me you're a feminist and i said that's bullshit no i'm not and uh you know we went ahead and uh, over the years uh, got married and he came back to me two or three years later into our marriage and he said but you told me you're not a feminist <laughs> <laughs> and now you are and i said so uh, you're you know <laughs> so what were his friends doing they were willfully misunderstanding feminism they were telling him she's a man hater and by you know i refused to get into the conversation i just dismissed it and uh, so uh this uh, th this misunderstanding is willful it this mindset you know putting it into the curriculum is not going to change anything it's already in the curriculum it's the mindset that needs to change it's the egos that we have built it's the privilege that we are sitting on that we have to agree to forsake true and and it's hard absolutely it's hard and it's when when you're willing to do that you will understand exactly what it means to look at everybody as equals not only men and women but rich and poor upper castes and lower castes the east and the west and how many men here don't identify as feminist i'm sure all of the fact that you're all here 
fairly means that you are all i mean very conversant with feminism and i mean how can you not be feminist i mean it's a you should bring up feminist boys i think that's the best way yeah please be <laughs> rational yeah yeah uh hello. he is asking questions uh hello ma'am uh yeah um my question is that um so today a lot of rights have been given to women in india already which has been really useful in a lot of ways but at the same time a lot of women especially in urban society have really been misusing these rights which have been turning a lot of people against feminism so what is your opinion on this and how do you think this problem can be combated maybe I think there's uh, uh when you say misusing the right I uh, I don't know if any one of you uh no, it's again one of the myths that is constantly, constantly repeated but it's an untruth that is constantly repeated if you look at the statistics yeah. uh if you look at crimes against women you will not find that women are making false accusations beyond uh, you know a certain number Or so uh, yeah. it's it's one of those myths that you're constantly repeating and then you think that it will become a truth it's picked up by others it's fed into minds uh, or and, the and, and that needs to be resisted thing that happened yesterday uh, i don't know how many of you have read the account of the woman who uh, who said that even the headline says uh, that i went on a date with Az aziz ansari and it turned out to be the worst the uh, worst nightmare and now many are saying that this is sexual assault and many people are saying well it was uh, it was mixed signals but then the end of it uh, the whole i the end of it is that how how did the women feel was there consent to men not understand the idea of consent do like do you need to yell out a no till somebody stops and even when you do will they stop so i think when you're saying misusing sometimes it's also um, not conversation that's been said properly it's just misunderstanding but then at the end of the day how did the woman feel did she feel exploited was she traumatized was she did she feel mentally harassed how can you how can you take that away from and the woman and does she have the right to tell that story does yes she, right she does that? before me too we did not give her the right to tell the story we said oh it's just a bad date you made a bad judgment no and it's a very systematic way to demonize women to trivialize the cases because really i mean don't buy the propaganda a lot we need those laws because those laws are actually saving a lot of women so you know it's like just just one propaganda which is just being used to demonize people There's a lovely young lady here with a placard saying it's a rap. <laughs> We'd be happy to talk to you uh, outside the venue.